Those forms are a pain in the butt and they're hard to get through. It's really, really easy to miss some information. So we're talking percentages, but you think 100,000 people actually put you know, an application in and got denied, which of course, clickbait headlines, 99% of the people got denied again. Well, great. 55% or 55,000 people didn't have enough payments. 24,000 people couldn't fill out the form correctly. Welcome to the Student Loan Planner Podcast. Today, I've got Ryan Inman with me today. I am super excited because Ryan is one of the few financial planners out there that understands student loans, and he's a personal friend and has been on his podcast, the Financial Residency Podcast. So we're going to have a lot to talk about. It's going to be a fun episode, particularly if you are going for public service loan forgiveness. So Ryan, welcome to the show. What's up, man? Thanks for having me on. This is going to be super fun. Why don't you start off telling our audience a little bit about yourself, your career journey, who your significant other is, and how that kind of influenced what you decided to do with financial planning? Yeah, similar to you, I am married to a physician. So she is a pediatric pulmonologist with the U.S. Navy as a civilian, not active duty. When I started, I should say that we met when we were 18, freshman year of college. So I've been around the whole time. It's been college, four years college, four years med school, three years residency. She then decided to do three years of fellowship. So lots of moving for her career. It's lots of fun times though, although being married to medicine isn't always as glamorous as other people think. When your spouse is, you know, on call every fourth night in the hospital and you basically are single for that night going, huh, this is not that much fun. But other than that, it's good stuff. So I started, I've always been the numbers nerd. And uh, started in, you know, really in financial planning when I finished grad school in 2008, which was pretty much the worst time possible to finish grad school as the whole market was crashing. We were in that kind of great recession. Make a long story short, worked for a couple planners and decided to go off on my own in 2015 and started my own practice. And I really wanted to work with physicians, people in the same kind of boat that we're in. You know, I know the joys and the pains of being married to medicine and that whole experience and obviously the financial planning side and physicians just need a lot of help. You go through training and you have really no formal training on financial topics or anything personal finance related. And that also led to me starting the podcast, which I've been lucky enough to snag Travis on twice now to be on the show, nerding out on student debt. So it's an an honor to be here and hang out with you. Thanks so much. And um, it's really cool that you have the financial residency podcast because, you know, frankly, a lot of financial planners will work with residents and sort of not charge them, which I think that you should be charged something because otherwise there's some sort of implicit debt that's owed to someone. And I just don't like that model, you know? Well, you know that they're always charged something, right? They sell them insurance and they get payments through that. And yeah, granted, it's not the resident actually paying for the service, but they say, hey, you need to buy disability, which you do, but hopefully it's from an independent agent, not from the planner who shouldn't have any conflicts of interest. There's always some sort of way they're getting paid, right? But, you know, so a lot of residents, though, they just don't think that they can have the bandwidth to think about financial planning. And so it's helpful to have podcasts like yours that really goes into a lot of things specific to physicians. And obviously we have a lot more people listening to this than just physicians because our podcast is really targeted at all student loan borrowers that have a lot of debt. But we do have a lot of people depending on public service loan forgiveness, both physicians and non-physicians. So that'll be a really interesting conversation for today. A lot of these conversations that we're going to have are going to be applicable to a lot of other high income professionals besides physicians. So really looking forward to it. So let's, let's kick it off by talking about the latest statistics on PSLF. So just a little bit of a background, and then I'm probably going to ask your your thoughts on, on each one of these stats. So we've had 1.13 million certified borrowers, unique borrowers, be approved for the PSLF program with at least one approved employer certification form. What are your thoughts on that number, 1.13 million? This student debt, and this is obviously going against even your business model, but like the idea that Anyone needs to hire someone like you or someone like me to understand student debt is a really sad state for what we're doing. You're telling everyone, hey, you can go off, get this great college degree, sign on these dotted lines. They don't give them a ton of education. And then when they actually comes time to pay, there's 4,000 different things that they can do. 
it's super confusing and they have to turn somewhere to someone like you that nerds out on this stuff to be able to explain it. The part that terrifies me is there's 1.13 million certified borrowers and only a fraction, a tiny fraction of those people are actually interested in what they're doing and trying to get help and trying to find out how they actually make the lowest amount of payments or get the most forgiven. It's a sad state that we're in. And I know that we'll probably end up talking a little bit on some of the stuff that's being proposed, but it's a lot of people. That's an entire generation that's hurting right now. Yeah. And I guess one reason why I joke that like this time next year, student loan planners either going to be hiring a lot of people or it's going to, we're going to be laying off everybody. It's like going to be one of the two because, you know, you know, if you have everything forgiven. I think you're going to be hiring a lot of people, my friend. Like I don't see this going away. And the whole idea of basically wiping the debt for everyone. I mean, that there's no way that's going to happen fiscally. It's so irresponsible to do that. And then you have a whole bunch of people who refied. What do you do with their debt? Oh my gosh, that'd be a nightmare. I think you're going to end up being overwhelmed. Maybe. We'll see. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit of a pipe dream to assume that some deus ex machina is going to come and fix your loans and just eliminate the problem. That said, though, I don't count PSLF and that sort of magical unicorn solution to things is a lot of personal finance talking heads do. And that's because you and I understand the program. And a lot of these people that talk about it just sort of understand it from a dagnabbit, get off my lawn politically. This is stupid. I mean, that that's the kind of they read a blog post and they've become experts is how that works. They don't nerd out on the details of the department of education reports and read 500 pages of proposed law like you do. Like it's just that people don't, they take the easy path and that's okay. But then to go off and blindly state, Hey, this is what's happening is so incorrect. And it's incredibly frustrating. I know you probably get really frustrated reading and hearing some of the stuff that people put out. I mean, you signed a promissory note and inside that promissory note, it talks about the public service loan forgiveness program. And if the government decides that their big conspiracy is going to screw everyone and get rid of the program or that the program isn't working and all these clickbait 99% that got rejected, and I know Travis, you'll want to go into a little bit why they got rejected. There's a stop hole. It's like legally, they can't get rid of it. You've now acted upon this. You are in the program. And even I was talking to an, an attorney who works in student debt and they're they're talking about just even all the new laws that are being proposed or or even potentially coming down the pipeline are talking about truly new borrowers. This isn't like, oh, you've made 64 payments out of 120 and the program's gonna get pulled. It's not, oh, I'm, you know, and I'll relate to doctors because that's what I nerd out on. Oh, I'm in med school, I've already taken out this debt, or I've just started residency and I'm I'm just making my payments. It's not for any of you. It's for truly new borrowers that haven't even taken on debt yet. Yeah, great point. And to dig into more of these stats, so of that 1.13 million certified borrowers, there's 102 billion on track for forgiveness uh, as of June 2019, which is the most recent report. 102 billion, and that's just the people who have submitted the paperwork and taken the time to actually fill it all out. When we made some projections that this is probably going to cost more than the annual budget of NASA, probably by 2024. So that's about 30 billion at least is is what we think it's going to cost per year, which is pretty staggering. So in terms of the approvals, there's been 1,216 people approved for, for, for PSLF with 90,000 unique borrower applications. So the approval rate is 1.4% now. It was significantly below 1% only a few months ago. So I know that that might not sound like a big deal, but that's kind of showing an exponential increase in the approval rate for PSLF, which we're projecting is going to happen from now until 2024. What are your thoughts about that approval rate? Where would you expect it to go over time, Ryan? Well, and I think the number, and I, and I don't know, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong on this one, but it was only like 1,800 people would actually be approved based on how the program was done. And I mean, first it was just, we're talking like ICR, right? Going back in history through 2009 and then IBR came out. And then in, what was it? Uh, 2013, it was pay. And then 2016 was repay. So we're not even in that much of the history of, of how many people could actually be approved. Uh, the idea that there was 90 or 100,000 applications that were still rejected, but 1,200 people you know, received forgiveness, that's, that's amazing. Because I don't think that the number was even that big to even start. If we look at some of the rejection reasons, 55% of the people were rejected by not even having enough qualifying payments, right? They didn't even 
have 120 payments, yet they were trying to get forgiveness. It's silly. Yeah. And so we'll go through that a little bit more. I mean, yeah, to, to break down the stats, like this is what I like to tell people. So, you know, you have 2010 and before, only about 20% of loans were direct loans and only direct loans are eligible for PSLF. You know, the, the loans before 2010 were FFEL loans for the most part, which were bank loans guaranteed by the government. Those are specifically not eligible for PSLF because the government doesn't want to forgive a bunch of debt owed to banks because then the banks go out of business, right? That's a, a big nuance that people all, you know usually miss that are not familiar with student loans. But you have 20% of people that could have been eligible with the right kind of loans. And then you figure there's been estimates that say about a quarter of the workforce is in a not-for-profit or government job. So you figure 0.2, 20% times 0.25 right? So you're down to about 5% of total student loan borrowers that could have the right kind of loans and have the right kind of employment. But then we know that you also have to pay based on your income. You have to figure out the number of people that were on ICR for, for 10 years. So you think about that, you probably figure how hard ICR was to sign up for. IBR didn't come into existence until 2009. So the people that could have signed up for ICR, I think, or probably say 10% of that population, which is probably optimistic, could sign up for, for ICR at that time just because of, of how complicated it was. So you figure that 0.1 times 0.05 is like 0.5%, right? 0.5% prior to 2009. So 2009 plus 10 years of service means 2019, which is today's date. Statistically, you would actually expect that only about 0.5% of people would be approved. Obviously, people don't know this stuff, no, don't know the, the complicated rules to get certified for it and get approved for it. Let's read some of these reasons that people got rejected, okay? So this sums up to 98% of the reasons why people were rejected. So the first reason is they weren't on IBR. They, they were on some sort of payment plan besides IBR. That's 55% of people that got rejected of the, of the total. So that's a really, really large reason. Makes sense. You know, they were just making payments. They don't know what plan they're on, Right. 24% was missing information. So that's like they forgot to sign the form. They didn't put the dates on the form. That makes a lot of sense from anybody that's ever worked in like a call center or any kind of data form processing center. People never fill out forms correctly. Just there's always errors made with this stuff. And so no eligible loans. So that's those FEL loans, those FFEL loans that were bank loans. That's 15% of the reasons for rejection. And the last two reasons, which are 2% each, are not having the right employment dates and then the employer just not being eligible, you know, not being a not-for-profit or, or a government employer. So that sums up to 98% of the reasons for rejection. Ryan, I don't know if you want to comment on any of those. Those forms are a pain in the butt and they're hard to get through. It's really, really easy to miss some information. So that totally makes sense. I am actually shocked it was only 24%, but we're talking percentages, but you think 100,000 people actually put you know an application in and got denied, which of course clickbait headlines, 99% of the people got denied again. Well, great. 55% or 55,000 people didn't have enough payments. 24,000 people couldn't fill out the form correctly, which I'm not knocking them because I know that form is not that fun to fill out and it is quite detailed. And then you got 15% that just had, let's call it fell loans or parking loans or whatever you want. That's 15,000 people. That's a lot of people when you add it all up. Travis said it was 98, but just those is 94,000 people of that 100,000. So perspective, right? Percentages, it's easy to go, well, that makes sense. But when you say the actual number of people, 94,000 out of the 100,000 applications, give or take, that is crazy to think. And I, you know, Travis, you hinted at it, but really the big bubble of the loan forgiveness approvals, which I'm terrified for this date is in basically in 2025 when it's like 150,000 people are eligible to actually have forgiveness based on being in the program for 10 years, the 120 payments, blah, blah, blah. I don't know about you, but we have clients that keep basically coming back to Fed loan saying, hey, we want to recertify. Hey, there's an error with our file. Hey, there's errors with dates. We had one client that he went to uh, residency for three years and then he had fellowship for a year. But the three years of residency, which, you know, would be like, let's call it 36 months for the timing, he had like six payments. Yet he had made all his payments. Everything's correct. The, the true number is correct, but the dates are wrong because in fellowship, which was only a 12 month fellowship, they credited like 39 payments. That's not physically possible. 
to have 39 payments made in a 12 month period. And I think even that little bit of detail is going to have issues when he comes through. Now he's 101 payments or something like that through. So we'll find out pretty quickly in the next couple of years, but we're still trying to get that fixed. And it's been nine months, you know, in 2025, if you're listening and you've gone through Travis's service or, or haven't, and you should, you should definitely do that. But going through and understanding all the pieces of the puzzle, making sure you have all your documentation. And if you find anything wrong, fix it now, not when 150,000 people are going to be trying to get forgiveness in the same year. That's the part that worries me, not will PSLF be around. It's how the hell is Fed loan actually going to be able to manage this when you've got a fraction, right? 1,200 people getting approved. How are they going to actually be able to handle the admin and paperwork of this? Yeah. You know, I honestly am one of these people that as much as I love to hate on Fed loan, I, don't, I actually don't think it's it's the majority their fault, as maybe angry as some people might be hearing that. You know, we're recording this, right? I know. Well, and as much as you hate Fed loan. I, I'm, well, I'm, so here's, here's the thing. The contracts that the government put out are low bid contracts. The person who wins is going to be the person that gives me the cheapest cost of processing what I want processed, basically. That means that your labor costs need to be low if your bidding is awarded based on a low bid, low cost contract. So that means I'm going to go to some sort of economically depressed area, right? You look at Naviant, I think they are headquartered in some like formal industrial town in Pennsylvania. I think Fed Loan is like, you know, in like Harrisburg or something, right? President Trump, didn't he call that controversially a war zone from his airplane once when he was flying over there? Funny that this is being recorded, right? LOL. But uh, so you have these low cost contracts that are awarded. Congress dis, dis, you know, made this program to be extremely complicated because I think a lot of lobbying was done to protect those FFEL loans. So I actually know that a lot of these lenders still have some of these FFEL loans on the books and they're wonderful sources of interest income for these lenders. These lenders are super worried about replacing that interest income when all those FFEL loans come off of the books. I think that that's a big reason why these FFEL loans were not made to be eligible because they were very concerned with these. I think these bank lenders were very concerned about having those loans just wiped away and not being reimbursed for those. I think that's why they dis dis developed the program like it was. And then also they needed time to develop the rules for this. The beginning of this program is, of course, extremely messy. And if you think about it, there's a lot of programs like this the government rolls out that are extremely messy, right? I'm sure the beginning of signing up for Medicare was probably not very easy. I'm sure the beginning of signing up for Social Security was not pleasant. I know that the, that what is that, the Section 199A deduction for the small business rules? Like that's been a- Oh, the QBI? Oh boy. Yeah, well, that's been a big headache, right? And so what government program has there ever been that's complicated that people- successfully navigate on their own. Certainly some people do. And, you know, certainly people don't necessarily need to hire somebody to get it. But to maximize it, you probably do need somebody that spends time going through the government bureaucracy and learning the rules because these programs are made very complicated in a very complicated fashion, right? I don't know. I mean, like, you know, yeah, in a perfect world, people shouldn't need to hire anybody. But, you know, in a perfect world, I shouldn't need to hire a financial planner. I shouldn't need to go to the doctor, right? I shouldn't need to have a CPA. But I have a CPA and it's just because my pain tolerance as my income has gone up has gone way down for dealing with BS. And a lot of the forms that are asked for, for state and local taxes and federal taxes and the proving things, I mean, it's just a giant unpleasant experience. If I can pay to avoid an unpleasant experience as my income has gone up, I'm very happy to do that. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I'll come at it from the financial planner perspective, right? Not everyone should hire a planner. Not everyone would be a good candidate to work with a planner. I don't even pretend that even half the population should probably work with a planner because there's a lot of people out there that will DIY and do it successfully. But there's a lot of people out there that just will not take the advice and be serious about it and actually implement it. And those people, it would make a hard relationship with the planner and the client and it wouldn't really go anywhere. The people who should work with a planner, we just actually did a case study on the show and it was the only thing I've saved for the future is in my 401k and I've maxed it out every year this year. You can do 19,000, but that's all I've done, but I don't really understand what I'm investing in. I just picked a one that had a number 
and it sounded good. Now, it turns out it was a target date number, so she's in a target date fund, but then goes on to say as she's recording this little voicemail for me that she feels uneducated. Keep in mind, she's a physician, doesn't understand the investment options, and really, then here comes the excuse, and I called her out. I don't mean to be insensitive, but it was, I'm too busy. I don't really care, and I don't really want to learn this stuff. It's like, well, if you are too busy and you don't really want to learn it, who else is going to understand your finances? Who else is going to help you manage that? Because you should care about more, more about your money than anyone else. Sometimes I feel like we do with clients, like we care a little bit too much. And I know Travis, when you talk student debt, I know you were super into it. It's frustrating sometimes when people don't take your advice, but if no one's looking out for your finances and you've just said on this recording that the only thing you're saving is in your 401k and you don't even understand that, you're basically an ostrich with your head in your sand. Take control over your finances. I don't care if it's student debt, if it's your insurances, if it's your cash flow and budgeting. Clearly, if you're listening to this show, you're trying to take care of your student debt. You're trying to understand it. You're putting your best foot forward. But don't just sit here and listen to Travis week after week and not do anything about it. That's the absolute worst thing you can do. Have all this information and then not take any action. Whether you work with Travis or you work with someone else or you don't work with anyone, you figure this out on your own, awesome. Just make sure that you actually put it into action and don't just sit here week after week trying to figure out student debt, but then never actually call Fed loan if you're going for PSLF and actually try to take control. Because Travis, I don't know if you feel like this, but sometimes I feel like I'm a general sending his troops knowing that they're going to die, right? I know Fed loan, it is going to be painful. I know it is going to be frustrating. I know that it's going to take quite a bit of your time to figure this out, but you have to figure it out. No one else can do it for you. Travis, myself, other people, we can educate you, but you have to do the work in order to get the results. I would kind of compare it to hiring a personal trainer. Like you still have to do the squats and the push ups, right? And the pull ups. Oh, if I could hire a trainer to do squats and pull ups for me and then I look like that, I'd do it. But that's not how that works. But that's, that's the reality is like, you can do it on your own and then, you know, yeah, that's possible and cheaper and then you might be successful, but then, you know, obviously you increase your odds of success if you have somebody that's pushing you. So I think that's really at the core, what somebody that's a successful person being advised by a professional is doing is they're engaged. But a couple other points before we move on to some other questions, I wanted to talk very briefly about the TEPSLF program, temporary expanded PSLF. So we've had someone on the podcast before, a couple that actually got rejected for their PSLF application, then got approved with TEPSLF. The approval rate for TEPSLF, there's been 726 people that got approved. Only about 16,000 or so, I believe, applied, or it was some, a lot smaller number than 100,000. So the the approval rate is actually pretty solid. It's like a few percent, like 4% or something like that. If you include those TEPSLF people to the PSLF applications in total, then that approval percentage goes up to like two or three percent, something like that. So the you know rejection rate is actually not ninety nine percent anymore. Pretty clearly, the TEPSLF program you have to get denied by PSLF first, and then you have to apply with TEPSLF, and you're only going to get approved if you have direct loans and you did certain things according to the rules. So I just wanted to read real quick the top three reasons why people get denied for that expanded PSLF option. So one is that the borrower has not been in repayment for 10 years. Apparently 35% of people, that's the number one rejection rate. So just mind boggling that you would apply for TEPSLF without actually being eligible for it. But, you know, but people do. The second reason is that the borrower did not meet the TEPSLF payment requirements during the last 12 months. So that's basically, you have to be paying at least what you'd be paying under the IBR plan to qualify for TEPS left during the last year. So a lot of people, you know, not doing that. And then the last reason, which is 15% of the denials, the borrower did not have direct loans. So again, unbelievable to me that people would apply for that initial PSLF, get denied, and then apply for TEPSLF with the wrong kind of loans, and someone still hasn't helped them figure that out yet. I mean, that's just mind-blowing to me. Well, people, you know, here's the thing, at least they're trying. And now it should be now on Fed loan to be like, hey, you didn't qualify for this reason. Now, we know that's not going to happen, but in a perfect world, that would have been amazing to have actually the servicer say, hey, you might have been uneducated now when you applied and got rejected, but here's the reasons why you got rejected. 
it comes back to like who's actually eligible for this stuff. So you have to submit the PSLF application for forgiveness and get denied to get going into this. You have to have the 10 years of qualifying employment, right? And, and be able to have those 120 payments. You know, those payments would have have to have been made after the October 1st, 2007. The denial has to be because some of your payments were not made under PSLF, but now you're back into the program. Like it just, it is mind blowing to see the thought process on this. But what's even more shocking is that Fed loan, and again, you know, not to knock on anyone because I, I know they are the low cost provider of this and it is someone on the other end of the phone that's earning probably minimum wage. It doesn't truly understand the whole process, but I still put this on Fed loan to educate people and not just say you're rejected with barely any reason why. Yeah, that's a great point. So let's talk a little bit about this program called the What You Can Do For Your Country Act. Such a killer name. I mean, I don't, I don't care what side of the party actually created this. Like, I don't want to be political, but like, what a catchy name. It's like JFK's famous speech, right? This was put forward by Senator Kane and Gillibrand, and this was basically a recent proposal, I think, in like the summer of, of 2019, spring or summer. And it basically said, you're going to create a new version of PSLF. You're going to call it five-year PSLF. So in other words, instead of waiting around for 10 years for something to be forgiven, you're actually going to get half of your loans forgiven after five years of service, which is really staggering because, I mean, that would mean that basically every physician on earth that does any kind of a fellowship at all would get half of their loans wiped away just for doing residency, which is really interesting. And then would also expand PSLF to places like Kaiser Permanente, where the people are employed through a for-profit entity instead of directly by the hospital, right? So that's a problem in California and Texas and some other states that have laws that prohibit direct employment of physicians. So it would have helped those people, I think. Now, you know, I might be getting a couple of the details confused with the AIM Hire Act, which is a very similar bill that the House Democrats put forward. But, you know, these are the kind of things that they've been trying to do. And then the other thing they tried to do was open the door for qualifying payments made on FFEL loans before consolidation. So basically, they would go look at your loan payments made on FFEL loans. And then what they would do to get around that concern of the banks of getting paid back is, you know, you just consolidate it. And now it's a direct loan and now it can be forgiven because what does the government care if you just forgive it all immediately after consolidating and paying the bank back, right? Now it's government debt. They can just wipe it away, right? So any any thoughts on that? So, I mean, I think that's really interesting to me because it kind of shows you that the Democratic Party has moved away from that sort of President Obama stance of let's means test PSLF and only forgive a, a limited amount. And now they're trying to make it where that it's, it's even more generous. I would, instead of the, the what you can do for your country act, I would almost call that like what can you do for physicians act? I mean, because that, that's kind of what it feels like to me. It, it really does. So those that aren't physicians might not understand, but like physicians, they go through like four years of medical school and then they usually come out and they have three maybe four-year residency programs. And then they are now an attending can go off and work in primary care, like a pediatrician, let's say. But if you stay a little bit longer, go through fellowship, you specialize or you subspecialize into something. So like my wife is a pediatric pulmonologist. She specializes in children's lungs. It took three more years of essentially training in order to be specialized. So if they came out with this partial benefit, I would be going like, are we going to have any primary care physicians ever? Because if you go through a three-year residency, all you do is stay two more years and you get half of your debt forgiven through a five-year forgiveness program. Like, why would anyone ever leave after three years? Two more years and you get half it forgiven is a no-brainer to me. So yeah, I think this would benefit physicians a lot. I get the them confused as well because there's so many changes. Nothing's like permanent. You know, they're coming out with this. But these guys did a hilarious job. They pulled one of like the online clickbait type things. They're using that 1% of uh, success rate or the 99% fail rate as one of their selling points in their in their piece. But the way I understood it was is that all types of federal loans would qualify for it and all types of repayment plans would qualify. So this would make it really, really easy to understand what's happening. The part that I think is laughable is that they wrote somewhere in there, and I had the text because I knew we were going to be recording, and I wrote it down. Public servants would receive clear information and guidance. Yeah, good luck, my <laughs> friends. There's no way that that is actually going to happen. 
that piece alone made it pretty laughable. The only way you would actually get that is with billions of dollars in additional appropriations specifically earmarked for loan servicers. You'd have to give billions of dollars to loan servicers and then actually hold them accountable. So you'd have to make it so that people could actually move loan servicers if they do a bad job. And then that would create competition and that would actually potentially create some incentives for them to actually wake up and do a good job. But you know, if you didn't have extra extra revenue available for people who have high quality results, then the, it would, you know that's just lip service. And it is kind of funny because that 99% rejection rate is a reason for passing this. I mean, the PSL program is going to get fixed automatically over time just because these direct loans were the default met- method of issuance. You have IBR plans widely available in the early 2010s. With absolutely no changes, PSLF will start fixing itself. It's just going to be a gradual process, whereas this bill would just dramatically expand PSLF way bigger than what's already in place. So it is really interesting to think about the the sort of political aspects of these things. Now, in terms of the political aspects, it seems to me that, that if you have a Democratic victory in 2020 – with the presidency especially, then PSLF is like super safe. And I would almost kind of wager that it would be expanded. And then if you have a Republican victory, I think you're just going to have status quo. I think that eventually come 2023, 2024 kind of time frame when they start realizing how freaking expensive this is, and you start seeing some bad headlines showing like, you know, this neurosurgeon drives a Range Rover and got their entire debt forgiven. Meanwhile, you know, your firefighter is still trying to figure out how to pay based on their income, right? You'll see some of those kind of things. And then I think it'll get repealed if you have the Republicans win. But again, for future borrowers, not not current borrowers. And I think med students, too, started getting direct loans as early as the class of in the fall of 2008. Um, I thought it was like the fall of 2010 because that's when you see you know direct loans widely available. But it seems like a lot of the med schools switched over to direct loans in, in the fall of 2008. I don't know if you've heard anything about that. I, I actually thought it was right in the middle as 2009. It might be. So, that, so there's some sort of in between that time frame. So you add 10 years to that graduation date for those physicians. So you're looking at somewhere between 2022 to 2024 when that first wave of physicians is going to get loan forgiveness. All the people right now are people that just happen to have fairly large balances from doing like one year master's degrees or undergraduate. And that's why we're going to see that big bubble. I mean, not the reason, but another reason why we're seeing that big bubble of, you know, 140, 150,000 people in 2024, 25 is, is in, in, in such a great point, Travis, that I almost feel like we need to just need to say it again. Like PSLF will fix itself because everything ended up being direct loans. You told me an interesting case study about this person that you know that had 500,000 of student loan debt and took a job just to make an extra little bit of money in private practice. So maybe, maybe you can talk about that and just more broadly about people who make mistakes inspired by their student loans. Oh, yeah, it was so unfortunate. So I was talking to someone and they basically said like, hey, I'm a family med physician and, you know, general internist, let's call it, make it easy. They said, hey, I've got about half a million in debt. I was working kind of these crappy shifts, not really super happy. I ended up getting this really great job with this private practice. I had to refinance my debt, which is a huge bummer, but at least I was able to earn some more money. And I'm sitting here thinking like, I know probably around what kind of salary you're making and it is not surgeon salary, right? You're not a dermatologist. I don't know how you're going to come out ahead. And it turns out they made about 25 or 30,000 more gross, not take home, but gross pay. And they now had to pay back that half million of debt. Now they were only, from what I understood, a couple years into PSLF, they were worried about the program. But now that they've refinanced out, they took this job, there's no going back. And this probably cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars in payments that they're now going to have to make. That's going to be really hard in that salary. Now, they lived up in the Seattle area, so super high cost of living area. I know that they can't be making that much. I didn't ask how much they made, but this was a huge mistake that if they just did a little more research and was like, I even tell people... Look, if you're going to make, let's just call it 200,000 and in private practice, you could take a job for like 150 and come out ahead if you had half a million in debt. I, without doing all the math and getting nerdy on it, it would come out okay uh, and you would get a lot forgiven. So hearing this type of story for 25, 30K is just, it's super disheartening. Was this person married? Like, did their spouse have any income or no? 
they were married. They weren't in medicine or anything like that. And I, I would guess that the spouse was under six figure income a year. They're in a hard spot in terms of paying for this now. Yeah. I mean, that's actually like a great point where student loans are complex. And in my opinion, like the more and more I do this, the more and more I think that if you owe more than you earn, you need a plan, period. In my opinion, just to make sure that you're not making a mistake. And is that self-interested? Yeah, it could be, but I'll sh- tell you why. Like that Seattle person is living in a community property state, right? So Washington state, community property state, that means when you file taxes separately, you equally distribute income on tax returns. If that person's making 250 and they've got a spouse making, say, like 90, so 250 plus 90 is 340, when you file separate, you distribute that household income half and half. So you put 170 on one return and 170 on another return. Under the pay as you earn program for that person in private practice, that person's going to pay 10% of 170. Let's say that person has a profit sharing plan or a retirement plan where they can max out those retirement you know, vehicles. You could probably reduce each person's share of the household income down from 170 to probably 150. And then if you look at the payment that they, w- they would make approximately, assuming that they have kids, then you're talking a monthly payment under pay as you earn of probably about $1,000 a month. So $1,000 a month monthly payment with this $500,000 loan, maybe you assume that they make another $1,000 a month that's going into mutual funds to cover their future tax bomb because they're in the private sector. So that's a total cost of about $2,000 a month. If you do a 20-year refi, then that payment's probably like $3,500 a month. If you do a 10-year refi, which is what they probably did, or you know, something like that, then the monthly payment is five thousand or five thousand five hundred a month. We hope that they did a 10-year. Most likely they couldn't afford the 10 year. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually a little bit more pro 20-year refi than than a lot of people are because you can always refinance it to a shorter term. I always like people starting off with a small monthly payment and then, you know, refinancing to something that's more aggressive later. But but yeah, I mean, that's just an example that that person could have had a total cash flow of about 2000 a month going to their loans and instead committed to something like 5000 a month. So that's 36 grand a year. That's like a entry level or mid-level BMW or Mercedes, right? So they're wasting a Mercedes every single year because they thought, you know what? A few hundred dollars is just too much to pay to get a student loan plan. So I really know better. I want to do this myself. I don't want to sound insulting or you know or anything, but uh, that's just it's mind blowing, and that's just that one example. And not to be insensitive, but my face was probably my chin was definitely on the ground because I'm sitting here even thinking just through part of the math, going like, I don't think you realized how bad you just screwed up, and I felt horrible. Clients don't pay me to be their friends; they they pay me to help them, and this person wasn't paying me to help them, but I still wanted to help. So I, I gave them some thought process on it, but they had already done the damage. There was no, there's no going back. They'd already, already done the damage. And I'm just sitting here going, oh, and my heart was like broken hearing it. That's one reason why you don't want marketing from a student loan refinancing company to make a decision for you, right? Nobody's going to stop you from taking out a car loan that's too much. No one's going to stop you from taking out a mortgage that's too big. No one's going to stop you from refinancing a private loan when you, you are refinancing a federal loan when you shouldn't. You know, there's good reasons for that. It's because the consumer has choice. But that's kind of why I, I think that you do need to take the time to listen to podcasts like this or yours and or just hire somebody that knows what they're talking about and making sure that you've had a, an objective review to make sure you don't make that mistake. Cause that's, that is a multi hundred thousand dollar mistake. And it's, it's something that I see frequently. Another kind of mistake that I'll see is, is people will make that decision to make more money in private practice without thinking about the hourly wage that they're being paid. So one example, I had a person who after adjusting for the PSLF value the private sector job paid them a little about 20,000 more per year and this is after adjusting for PSLF right the actual increase was maybe like 70 or something like that and then we looked at the hourly wage because a lot of times these academic type hospital jobs do have better quality of living you do have a little bit more flexibility and and better hours in some cases 
when we adjusted for that, we realized that the academic job was going to be more like 40 hours a week or 45 hours a week, and the private job was going to be more like 60, 65. So after adjusting for that hourly wage, we actually found that that job was going to pay them less after adjusting for the hourly wage, right? So they're getting paid less per hour in the private sector. They're just working more, and that's how they were making more money. So that's another thing to kind of caution people about when you're taking a job for loan forgiveness. We never recommend that people take a job for loan forgiveness or not take a job because they're worried about losing loan forgiveness. It's, it usually works out where if you want to make a lot of money, great, go do that, right? If you don't want to make a lot of money or you have other economic career interests, then take advantage of PSLF. So it's interesting how many mistakes people make with that. Absolutely. I mean, I see stuff like this all the time. That's probably one of the worst ones. I've seen, but it, it's just, it's soul crushing for those of us who nerd out on this to just hear. Yeah. And, th- and there's, and there's other lot less soul crushing ones. Somebody's on revised pay as you earn because the loan servicers read off a script and tell everybody that they need to sign up for revised pay as you earn. In some cases, that's not the right advice. IBR is always a plan you don't want to be on until it is a plan you want to be on because you're not eligible for pay and repay doesn't make sense, right? So there's all these nuances that people will miss. I would say that the six-figure mistakes are probably not the most common ones, but the five-figure mistakes are super common. It's kind of interesting to, to see how many minefields are around uh, for this kind of stuff. Another question I had for you is you had this experience with PSLF yourself. You, you were thinking about using it, but then you refinanced it using a home equity line of credit and then paid it off through real estate. So is this something that you would do today? And what would you do differently if you were addressing your wife's student loans now? Good memory, because I know we've talked about a couple of times what we've done personally and each other's stuff. My wife graduated from med school. She had about $125,000 of debt, which is really tiny considering that she's a physician. Part of it was because she went had in-state tuition. She went back to KU. She's from Kansas originally. She lived at home. She did all the right things, wasn't taking out extra debt to live off of or to travel or to do anything like that. And I, I didn't really let her. So she didn't she didn't get into too much trouble. Our average client is 298,000. So the average physician that we work with is is about 300,000. So she's started off really well. We got into the program and started filling out those ECF forms like really, really soon. She was about five years in. This is like middle of fellowship now. And she's about five years into PSLF. We had been talking a bunch about what she ultimately wants to do, where she wants to work, how she's kind of anticipating her career to look. Now, we had two kids in fellowship. So in a three-year period, we had two kids. They're now five and three. But as we were going through, she's like, look, I don't really want to work that much. I want to actually take some time off. I'm like, that's cool. Like, we can plan around that. We've, We've always been the family that saved one salary and spent one salary. And I was like, no problem. I can work. This is good. How long do you want off? She's like a year. I'm like, Ooh, okay. A year is not just a couple months, but we, we can make that work. We've saved enough. We're doing the right things. I know her though. She's super type a, she's a go-getter. She's significantly smarter than I am. I'm totally fine saying it, but I was like, there's in deep down, I'm like, there's no way that she's going to take a whole year off. But as we went through this, it kind of made sense that where she ultimately wanted to work and what she wanted to do wouldn't be eligible. It wouldn't be a 501c3 that we'd stop the payments for six to 12 months, which is okay. You don't have to have the 120 payments consecutive. We ultimately made the decision and I don't necessarily recommend this unless you're really sure, but we ultimately made the decision. Her, her rates were weight average was close to 7%. We refied using a HELOC on my mom's house actually at the time, you could write off that interest. Now you can't with the, the new tax laws that are coming in. They eliminated that the interest for non-real estate being deductible. So you can't do that anymore. And I think the change there, Travis, would be we were in San Diego. I'd probably just go with First Republic at that point with their super, super low rates as opposed to jumping through the hoops and the HELOC and all that. Ultimately, instead of making bigger payments to my mom. We made the minimums and we invested in real estate as Taylor was getting back into working. Uh, We had done that prior to her leaving fellowship as well. And we ended up essentially, long story short, 
selling some of our real estate that was in Vegas, which is where our whole family's from, and then lump sum paying it off. Would it work today? Maybe. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that it was good or bad. It was actually quite risky, but my risk tolerance is quite high. But I would, I would say, you know, could you invest in real estate and ultimately pay down your loans? Yes. Would it work in the timing that it worked for us? Probably not because the real estate had not uh, appreciated that much. Now, as you're listening to this, real estate's gone nuts uh, along with the markets all throughout the country. So there's, there's deals out there, but not that many. Whereas when we were investing in 2012, 2013, 2014, there was plenty of deals to be had. I like the story. It's so It shows a different way that you can kind of tackle student debt or the way you're paying it down. It comes back to having a plan in place, talking through those things, understanding maybe PSLF, the numbers worked, but if your career doesn't want to go that way or you don't want to take that career, you don't want to just sit in a, a job that you don't want to do for the sake of student debt, unless it's six figure massive amounts of, of forgiveness or, you know, I guess everyone's kind of got their own thing, but I would say prioritize the goals piece of that first. And obviously the math is very important, but it's not everything. Also, I guess first Republic, another big change is, is it's a lot harder to refinance with them. I just met with a rep and I was like, what are you guys doing? Why, why would you be making this so hard? Like you have to have like 15% of the total balance of your loans that sits in an account with them that earns basically no interest and tons of to be within what 30 minutes of their brick and mortar bank, which is super old school. It's ridiculous, but it was not that way at the time. Yeah. I mean, they, st- they still give really good rates, but I mean, it's just a little bit harder, right? I think that the reality is, is you could have either gone the, like the 1.95% fixed route and then tried to get that, that kind of a rate, or you could have just done like a variable rate, which is what we ended up doing similar amount of debt actually that my wife had and um, was not eligible for PSLF really with her kind of setup. I will say that if I had known everything that I know now, I might have been inclined to have her go for PSLF anyway. And the reason is FedLoan lost a lot of our credit towards forgiveness. There's a very good chance that she had at least three years of PSLF credit on everything when, when we applied and they only said that she had it on half the loans. I think that what I would do now is, you know, at the time we were in Pennsylvania, so I would have contacted our congressperson and I would have contacted our senior senator. I think that's probably Bob Casey, maybe in Pennsylvania. And then I would have contacted the constituent services office. And that's actually the route to getting your PSLF payments fixed the fastest. For example, if you're in California, you have a client in California, I would contact Senator Kamala Harris's office, constituent services office specifically, and then get them involved with Fed loan. And then, then it'll usually get fixed, honestly, within two weeks. You know how ridiculous that is though, right? That is the process that you have to go through. So if everyone listening here wants to understand student debt, but not take a ton of action, you're missing out on a lot because the action is where it's at. You have to actually go do these things, which I think is ultimately super flawed that you have to go outside the resources of just the freaking servicer to get anything done. But I mean, these are the things it takes to get your student loans in place. And that's kind of why I was like, Hey, it's like a general sending his troops to die. Like, I know that this is not fun stuff, but these are outside the box ways of of thing. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's, it's nuts. It's ludicrous that you have to go through these steps to make sure that your debt is done correctly and accounted for correctly. The thing is, is also now we would have been able to get those pretty low IBR payments for an extra year after she finished fellowship because of the clarity now that we have about how the servicer wants to know your prior year tax return and that's it. We probably would have gotten four years worth of payments on a really low monthly payment. Then we would have had six years worth of payments where the IBR payment would have just gotten capped. She would have had to have paid about $1,200 a month. And there would have been probably been like a $50,000 balance left to forgive. So that might have saved us a little bit of money if I had known everything I know now back then. But uh, but it would have been a lot of work. It would have been a lot of work for that $50,000. It probably would have frankly just been because it would have been fun for me to actually have to go through the process that we're recommending to so many people, right? So, so sick and twisted that you're, you're thinking it'd be fun to go through that. But I know how you are. Of course, it'd be fun to go through it. Yeah, our our thing was so, a little similar. I don't know the actual number. I've never done that math actually to know what it would have been if we would have gone through and actually ultimately got forgiveness. 
because I knew that we'd be breaking it up. It turns out we would have had a over two year gap in that it would just have been not the right thing for us to do for that. And thankfully now we're, we're student loan debt free. If you want to call it that definitely not debt free, have a mortgage, but student loan debt free at least. We've got a little few minutes left. So maybe we can talk about how student loans are just one piece of the financial planning puzzle. And, and especially in terms of how much people save and where they put those savings. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I think that there's like 10 steps really to like be able to build out a, a financial plan and student loans is one piece of that puzzle. And I think before you go and try to implement any financial plan, you need to stop and actually like think through goals. Now, I mean, most people have never written down goals, especially like the ones that come to work with us. They're like, oh, I've never even thought about it. And physicians are notorious for just plowing through training and then not thinking like more than a day ahead. What I'd want you guys to sit down, and this is applicable to everyone, is to understand like, what are your opportunities coming up? What are your challenges coming up? What's that ideal life look like? If you could write out an ideal year, what would you write? Where would you be? Where would you be going? Who would you be with? What's an ideal day look like? It could be a work day. It could be a non-work day. Speaking of work, like what would you want to be doing for a job? If you had unlimited amounts of money, what would you be doing? Now, back into kind of reality where you didn't have unlimited amounts of money, where is it that you can make small steps to that life that you ultimately want? And then I'd start bringing in some of the financial pieces, right? Creating a net worth statement, which is essentially all your assets minus all your liabilities. Understanding the flow of money, right? Understanding, and I say the B word, and I'll preface this, I call it the dreaded B word on the show, because as soon as I say the word budget, everyone's like, nope, I'm done. Like, tune off, we're out. Please don't do that. Today, looking backwards is budgeting. Today, looking forwards is cash flow planning. Ideally, everyone needs to understand how the flow of money works and get to a point where you're thinking ahead. I expect to spend this amount. Everyone hates budgeting because usually it's, oh my gosh, I spent $300 in entertainment and I only budgeted 200. I'm a terrible person. All these negative emotions come up with budgeting when in reality, that whole process of budgeting or cash flow planning is what really sets you free. It allows you to understand what you're expecting to spend and then what to do with the extra money. And student debt belongs in there, right? You have a payment. You have to make that payment. It is very bad if you don't make that payment. Please never get to that point. Next would be kind of building out this debt payment plan. And of course, student debt is, is a huge in that, but other debts would be auto debt or consumer debt, like credit cards or personal loans, maybe debt to family members, like everything that revolves debt, you'd want to be tackling. Then there's in insurance. And when you're looking at insurance, you know, usually like for physicians, disability is incredibly important, long-term disability. You'd have term coverage. Hopefully you would staying away from all the permanent insurances like whole life and all those other horrible things that are typically pitched. And then I'd be getting to the investment. So once you have all of these pieces put together and you know how the flow of money works and all that, now we're coming to investments, understanding those pieces, and then it's the state planning, taxes, and implementation of the actual plan. You're not making any changes until you work through kind of that whole process of a plan. You can hire someone to help you this, or you can do it on your own. There's tons of information out there to do it. I actually am writing a whole book on this that'll be out January 15th called Financial Residency, so self-titled, that will walk you through all these pieces. Getting back to, you know, do you need to hire a professional or not? Most people know. But if you don't want to nerd out on this stuff, you don't want to go through these things, you have to understand it. Understanding student debt is absolutely critical, but it is not a full financial plan. And you need to make sure that you're thinking holistically. And there's the quantitative side and the qualitative side. And really, the goals are what motivates you and you're trying to blend what it is you really want and have your money work for you to get that versus the other way around of, well, I worked, I went through and I, I hate my job. And I can't wait for a Friday afternoon to enjoy the weekend. It's kind of ingrained in our culture, which is unfortunate, but it means that like you hate 60 plus percent of your, your day to day. And that's a horrible way to live. Figure that part out first and the money pieces will follow really behind. That's great. Ryan, where can our community find out more about you and, and what do you want them to know? Yeah. So the podcast is called Financial Residency. Come hang out. It's been awesome. There's been some shows 
that Travis has done that we've nerded out on student debt. I know that Travis is what 50 some odd shows in now. So there's a lot of student debt here that you can can understand on his show, but we're really talking holistically. I look at it as going five feet down and a mile long, right? So I want to touch on every financial topic that you would need to be understanding or need to know about as you start to build out really that financial plan, financialresidency.com. And then if you potentially want to work together, my fee-only financial planning firm where I work with physicians all across the country is called Physician Wealth Services. Awesome. So today's show notes will be at studentloanplanner.com slash 51 or just studentloanplanner.com slash podcast if you want to see all of the shows that we have. Thank you so much, Ryan, for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, bud. 